Good afternoon and welcome to CUHK Law and the latest in our Greater China Legal History Seminar Series. My name is Stephen Gallagher and it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Malcolm Merry. Uh, before we get into Malcolm's talk, I just wanted to um, say to you all, I'm sure you all have questions about today's topic. If you do um, have any questions, please use the chat function and you can send questions in to me and I can ask Malcolm at the end of the talk. So um, many of you will know Malcolm, of course, from his time in Hong Kong as a practitioner and as a teacher. I think Malcolm is the first person to be back to do his fourth Greater China Legal History Seminar for us. So thank you very much, Malcolm, for coming back again. Um, so Professor Malcolm Merry, then, as I said, many people will know that Malcolm spent more than 40 years in Hong Kong as a practicing barrister, uh, an author, a lecturer, a senior lecturer, an associate and adjunct professor at the University of Hong Kong. Um, he's known for his writing on land law and his pre three previous seminars for us were on aspects of, uh, of Hong Kong land law, in particular, of course, the small house policy as well. Uh, but more recently, he's developed an interest in and published works on Hong Kong's legal history, including two books with the Hong Kong University Press. Uh, the first of which, of course, was The Unruly New Territories, which dealt with many aspects, including land law in the new territories. Um, and of course, the book that we're here to discuss today, which is Grounded at Kai Tak. Uh, so Malcolm is going to give his presentation to you now. I will say at the beginning that there is a discount offer uh, for people who have come along today to buy the book. Um, we'll put up details of that at the end as well, um, so that I'm sure many people will be interested in getting a copy. And there is a significant, I think, a 30% discount available if you use the code uh, for attending today's talk. So with, uh, with no more ado, let me pass over to Malcolm, who will be talking to you about Grounded at Kai Tak, Chinese aircraft impounded in Hong Kong, 1949 to 1952. Uh, thank you, Steve. Welcome, everybody. This book is about 71 airplanes which were grounded at Kai Tak in the period 1949 to 1952. The, the story is somewhat convoluted. I'm going to simplify it. And it's full of twists and turns. Uh, perhaps I can take it up in the spring of 1949. The Chinese Civil War was approaching its final phase then. The communists had advanced from the north uh, as far as the Yangtze River. And Nanking, the Kuomintang capital, was threatened. And so was Shanghai, the ma major commercial city in China, which was the base and headquarters for the two main uh, commercial airlines then operating in China. They were both government controlled, uh, but this was a new and glamorous industry, uh, airline uh, travel. And CNAC, one of those two airlines, was in fact a joint venture between the Chinese government and Pan Am, the American uh, airline. They, Pan Am had, I think, a 20% interest in, the C, in CNAC. The other main airline, CATC, Central Air Transport Corporation, uh, was totally government owned. It, it was, in fact, a department of the uh, nationalist government. <clears throat> CNAC, as I expect many of you know, standing for China National Aviation Corporation. Well, these two airlines operating out of Shanghai decided to move to Hong Kong. They moved their offices and their workshops, their staff, hundreds of staff, and aircraft, eventually 82 aircraft, to Hong Kong, to the only airfield in Hong Kong at that time, which was Kai Tak, many of us of a certain age, remember Kai Tak Airport. Of course, it was much simpler in those days. It was not just a civil aerodrome, it was also a Royal Air Force base. Initially, the, the aircraft uh, and, and the airlines were welcomed in Hong Kong. It was felt to be quite a feather in Hong Kong's cap to, how, to be the headquarters of these major uh, organizations. 
Kaitak was a small aerodrome. It was on reclaimed land at the top of Kowloon Bay. In those days, it didn't have the distinctive runway jutting into the harbour, into, into Kowloon Bay, that was familiar later on. That was added in the late 1950s. So Kaitak was just a sort of scissor-shaped Two, two runways, short runways at the top of Kowloon Bay. There wasn't much space, especially when the, the RAF were operating out of it. <clears throat> so 80 odd aircraft and associated equipment was crowded onto the uh, apron of the airport. The air airliners were parked around the perimeter. But in mid 1949, in the summer, uh, the British government and a, a, la a Labour government decided that it was necessary to beef up Hong Kong's defences, uh, uh, improve the uh, uh, garrison there. The garrison was doubled, more or less, and reinforce the RAF. Uh, and then the, the airlines were asked to move. The Chinese airlines were asked to relocate by the Hong Kong government because there wasn't the space for them and the RAF. And here we come to the first of several twists in the story. The airlines, although they were, uh, of course, from China, and although they were nationalists, the nationalists had established themselves in Formosa, as Taiwan was then called, they refused to move. Why? Well, CNAC, uh, hoped to capture the Chinese market after the end of the Civil War. As I say, it's 20% Pan Am owned. So the Americans had identified uh, chi mainland China as a, a major future market for them. And they felt that if they were based at Hong Kong, neutral territory, as it were, between the warring factions, they had a better chance of being readmitted to the mainland after the end of the Civil War. It was also felt that the airfields in Taiwan were inadequate for the airplanes that were operated by the two airlines. The planes, incidentally, were cargo and passenger planes, not, of course, military planes, but uh, they were called transports in those days. And they were largely US Army surplus, World War II surplus aircraft. So they were quite new, but second hand. Uh, now the governor of Hong Kong in those days was a man called Grantham, so Alexander Granf Grantham. And he wanted the planes to be removed, really because he had quite enough problems on his plate. Hong Kong in 1949 was grossly overcrowded. There were large numbers of so-called uh, refugees coming in from the mainland, uh, and there were squatters establishing themselves, so-called squatters establishing themselves on the uh, hillsides, mainly in Kowloon, and a general lack of accommodation in the territory. There was hardly a, a hotel room to be had. The infrastructure had suffered, of course, badly during the four years or so of Japanese occupation, and the place still hadn't fully recovered by any means. There was a lot of poverty as well in, in Hong Kong, although the economy was actually doing well. It was fairly booming, uh, partly as a result of the Civil War, which required, of course, a, a, a lot of, of army expenditure, which was handled through Hong Kong. Grantham also had a fear of violence, particularly, particularly violence between political factions, the communists and the nationalists in Hong Kong, because the two were vying for influence with uh, schools uh, and trade unions and so on within uh, the colony. And there was this general uncertainty about Hong Kong's future. What will the communists make of this uh, colonial outpost on the southern shores of China. Uh, the attitude of the communists was really unknown. So the airlines relocated the staff, hundreds of staff found themselves in this British colony quite far from their homes. 
And one can well imagine that, that uh, as they realized what was happening, the fact that it was unlikely that they would return to the mainland, their discontent grew. They didn't fancy the idea of living in Formosa, nor staying in Hong Kong. At Chiang Kai, uh, the, the nationalist regime, General Isimo Chang, had already fled to Formosa in September 1949. Uh, the declaration of the People, People's Republic of China, of course, it famously had occurred on the 1st of October 1949, even though at that point the communists weren't in control of the whole of the mainland. And the nationalists in mid-October had abandoned Canton, which was their stronghold, really. So it was quite plain what was happening. The com communists would take over uh, fully in China shortly. The staff eventually formed a trade union, a communist dominated trade, trade union, and there was a lot of discussion between them. And eventually on the 9th of November, 1949, they revolted. This was the second twist in the tale, the defection of the majority, not the whole, but the majority of the airline staff. And on the 9th of November, the local managing directors of the, each of the airlines, together with air crew, flew 12 of the planes to the mainland, to the, uh, back up to uh, main, mainly to, uh, to Tientsin, I think, but one plane went to Peking to report to the Civil Aeronautical Administration of the New People's Republic. And there they were, were, were warmly welcomed uh, and uh, reappointed. The managing directors were reappointed uh, as in charge of the airlines uh, when they were to return to Hong Kong. They'd left, incidentally, an emergency committee in charge guarding the planes. Uh, they were consisting of the committee consisting of staff and communist sympathizers in Hong Kong. And they took control, this committee took control of the remaining 70 aircraft. So originally 82, 12 went to the mainland, leaving 70. One came back with the managing directors. So we're talking really about 71 aircraft eventually at Kai Tak. And most of the staff had defected. Uh, the, the defectors were welcomed by Zhou Enlai, the premier of the new government in China. He reappointed the managing directors and he declared the planes the sacred property of the People's Republic. And most importantly, the communists began to pay the staff. I think that was on the 12th of November. This was of course a big shock to the nationalists but they managed to uh, react fairly quickly and appointed, the nationalists appointed new bosses of the airlines in Hong Kong. Uh, and the Minister of Communications flew from Taipei to Hong Kong to supervise action to be taken uh, regarding the airplanes. They suspended the certificates of registration of the aircraft so they, they couldn't uh, officially fly. They declared that the air crew licenses were of no effect, and they appointed an agent to secure the remaining planes, an agent at, at Kai Tak in Hong Kong. <clears throat> they asked the Hong Kong authorities to immobilize the planes <clears throat> and suspend the permits, the permits to enter Kai Tak, the identity cards in effect, of the defectors. And uh, Grantham, the governor, politely declined to do that and suggested that the nationalists collect the permits and give them to the authorities at Kai Tak, which of course the nationalists were not, uh, not willing to do. They were afraid of violence themselves. They also, the nationalists also engaged an eminent law firm, Messrs. Wilkinson and Brist, who are still operating, of course, in Hong Kong uh, to uh, fight back through the courts. 
and they they the nationalists hired security guards, Sikh security men to guard the planes. And of course, they dismissed all, of the, all the defecting employees. So as a, that was all happening in the second half of November. I mentioned they appointed an agent. Who was the agent? Well, it was an American called Whiting Willauer, uh, who operated an airline in Hong, in Hong Kong and China, small airline called CAT. Uh, this was a contractual airline, not a regular passenger airline. And Willa, Willow were, was a man who had been in the mainland in aviation for some, some years. He'd set up CAT, his little airline, uh, with some American investors, uh, in effect, the third airline in China, small airline. The principals were himself and a retired American Air Force general called Claire Lee Chenault. Chenault was a colorful character and he had uh, established the so-called Flying Tigers in China in the 19, for early 1940s. <clears throat> he, he was quite a charismatic Texan. Well, was he Texan? He was from Louisiana, really, but he, everyone thought he was Texan. He, he was a small, leckety man with a jutting jaw, and he'd served in the US Army Air Force uh, for some years and reached the rank of captain, but he'd been invalided out because of hearing problems. Uh, which is a great blow to him, but he had gone to China to set himself up as an aviation expert and got close to Chiang Kai-shek and his wife, Madame Chang, one of the Sun sisters there. Uh, uh, and uh, by that means, he had considerable influence on, amongst the nationalists before the civil war uh, got underway. He was famous for establishing the Flying Tigers. It's a vol American volunteers. They were US pilots from the Navy and the Army Air Forces of the US, which had been secretly established by President Roosevelt in the early stages of the Second World War before the Americans joined to resist the Japanese. And Roosevelt had identified uh, one of his uh, henchmen to help with that, uh, to, to set up the uh, Flying Tigers to resist the Japanese. <clears throat> uh, and they, they flew over the, the so-called hump from Burma supplies into the help the nationalist forces. Unfortunately, most of the supplies never reached them. They were taken by various people en route. But the Flying Tigers became a sort of heroic, romantic group, which was taken up by the American press, particularly Time and Life, the two main news magazines, to project the grand opposition by Chiang Kai-shek to the Japanese invaders. So they, they were considerably... They, they had considerably more publicity than their efforts actually deserved, I think. Anyway, Willauer was appalled by what had happened to the Chinese airlines in Hong Kong with the defections uh, of the staff. And he promptly flew to Taipei and secured an interview with Chiang Kai-shek and got the General Isabeau to agree that he, Willauer, would act as the nationalist agent regarding the planes. That was on the 11th of November, 1949, so just a couple of days after the revolt. <clears throat> the Hong Kong government refused to get involved. They wouldn't, they wouldn't help Willauer. So what Willauer did when he got back to Hong Kong, he, he, he and his accomplices, they deflated the tires of some of the planes at Kai Tak to stop them flying, any more of them flying away. And he spread rumors that there would be vehicles blocking the runways to prevent further departures. 
And the governor and the police in Hong Kong feared violence as a result of what was happening, and that they ordered the removal of the guards from the aircraft. That was complied with, and the, uh, the communist sympathizers, workers, uh, took practical control of the aircraft, the 71 aircraft. But the governor announced that the planes would not be allowed to fly until there was clarification regarding the Sino-British Air Agreement. A clarification, I suppose, as to who was in charge of the uh, aircraft, which side, and uh, who was going to agree, uh, follow the agreement. Um, Wilkinson and Grist approached the Attorney General, and that time is a man called John Griffin, uh, who's from an old colonial family, and uh, they uh, approached him and asked for his help in uh, securing the planes, and he didn't want to get involved. He suggested that Wilkinson and Grist obtain a court order to prevent the planes flying off, uh, uh, even though the communists were in practical control. And legal action was begun on the 24th of November 1949. Both sides obtained interim injunctions from different judges prohibiting the removal of the two airlines uh, assets, including the planes, from Kai Tak. So there were, there, there were, there were sort of double uh, prohibitions on removal of them, legal prohibitions. And the airlines lawyers then prepared an application to the court for appointment of receivers for those assets. Now, the receivers uh, are supposed to be independent third persons in litigation who hold disputed property uh, in a pending resolution of the question of ownership. So it seemed a very natural and sensible move to ask the court to uh, guard the planes in effect, pending the outcome of the litigation. Uh, Willauer and Chenault incidentally feared that the planes would be used for the invasion of Formosa. You may say, well, why did they get involved? They were running a uh, rival air, air, uh, air outfit. Uh, why, did, why were they concerned about these aircraft and other airlines? And the answer was that they thought that paratroopers might be uh, used with these aircraft or armaments might be dropped, supplies might be dropped in an invasion of Taiwan. There was another twist. On the 12th and 13th of December, after Willow had gone back to uh, Kai Tak and really had uh, not got the cooperation he was hoping for from the authorities, on the 12th and 13th of December, the nationalist government sold all the aircraft, all the CATC and CNAC assets, in fact, to CAT. This twist meant that the Americans, if you can call them that, that's Willow and Chenault, were suddenly interested officially in the aircraft. They were claiming the ownership of them. And what had happened was that Willow had raised financial support from contacts in Washington, D.C., including uh, support from a man called Tommy Corcoran, who was, uh, had been an aide to President Roosevelt under the New Deal in the 1930s. And he'd really become a political fixer, one of the first sort of lobbyists in America. And he was an investor as well and had uh, financial contacts. So he helped, he was a shadowy person behind CAT, in effect a shareholder. And another contact in Washington who got involved was a man called Bill Donovan, Big Bill Donovan, as he was nicknamed. 
Corcoran himself had a nickname, Tommy the Cork. He was called Tommy the Cork by President Roosevelt. He, he had these extensive connections in Washington. Tommy was a, a small, dapper, loud individual. By contrast, Donovan was, a, was large, as his nickname Bill, why a big Bill connoted. He was a former, Donovan was a former war hero who had become a politician and then a, a, a lawyer in the US, first of all in Buffalo, and Natalie is a, a partner in a Wall Street law firm. Uh, he was large and blunt uh, and fearless. In fact, he had another, another nickname, Wild Bill Donovan, because uh, in the, on the American football field in his youth, he was notorious for his, his aggressive tactics. And in the First World War, in which he fought, uh, he had been very reckless in the fighting. Uh, another string to his bow was he, he set up US intelligence during the war, the forerunner of the CIA. Uh, it wasn't called that in those days. He was behind that. And in fact, late, in later years, there was a statue of him in the foyer of the CIA headquarters in Washington. So the, these were two colorful characters in this tale. There were quite a, a few of them. Uh, returning though to the law side, there was a complex sale contract, obviously drawn up probably by, by, by Donovan's law firm uh, to govern the sale to Willauer and Shenault of the 71 aircraft. Of course, it was a bit of a strange sale because there was no delivery of the goods. The goods were at Kai Tak in Hong Kong, not in, not in the home jurisdiction of the contract, which is either tai, Taiwan or the US. Uh, and there was no immediate payment either. The payment was by promise, promissory notes. <clears throat> And there were, there were some unusual provisions in the contract. For instance, they were, the planes were not to be used in the communist areas of uh, China. And they were to be sold to an, a corporation that was to be established. Now, that corporation was to be established by uh, Tommy the Cork, Corcoran, in fact, and investors, including him, were, were to provide the money for the sale, the backing. But the front men remained Willauer and the general uh, Chenault. The nationalists incidentally were to have an option of acquiring shares in that future corporation that was to hold the planes. So there, there were some rather suspicious clauses in the sale contract. The planes had now become a US interest. And this of course was alarming to Hong Kong and Britain. The UK Foreign Office was very concerned that now Britain and Hong Kong had become caught in the middle of this dispute, which was in effect between the US and communist China. Uh, the US State Department quickly got involved. This shows, of course, the influence of Corcoran and Donovan in America. The US State Department asked the British government whether what they called extraordinary measures could be taken to secure the planes for the Americans. They said, well, our people have bought them. Can't you take some sort of executive action to seize the planes and give them to our people. The State Department instructed the US Consul General in Hong Kong, a man called Carl Rankin, to assist Shenault and Willauer and CAT in their efforts to gain control of the airplane. So they, they went out and to see the governor, uh, and this was the beginning of weeks of US pressure on the UK and Hong Kong uh, to help the US interests. 
But the Foreign Office, the British Foreign Office, and the Colonial Office, which is of course the boss of, of uh, the governor, were adamant that ownership was a legal question and it was to be decided by the courts in Hong Kong. So the, the uh, attitude of the UK government was, this is nothing to do with us. It's not a, a, a matter for uh, executive action. It's a legal question and the Hong Kong courts will decide it in due course. That was not accepted by Donovan. He feared that the British government would soon recognize the Central People's Government, the Communists, as the official government of China. The rumors were flying that recognition was imminent during December of 1949. And Donovan thought that it might very well affect the uh, outcome of any case, hence he wanted to avoid that case. The Foreign Office legal advisor, Sir Eric Beckett, uh, had already, in fact, told UK ministers, the Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, that recognition was legally justified in late October, that the, the conditions for recognizing the communist regime as the legitimate government of China were in place. Uh, but the UK government didn't want to rush into this. They, they feared uh, that the US would resist. Uh, and indeed, the US was resisting recognition. The UK wanted, if possible, to move in concert with the US, but also with other allies, particularly Commonwealth, British Commonwealth allies. And in fact, what was happening during December and, and November, indeed, was that a diplomatic rift was emerging between the UK and the USA. There was a different a difference of attitude towards recognizing new governments. The UK took the line that uh, it was a question of reality. You look at it, and if if you think these new uh, th these new people are in fact in charge, sufficiently in charge of the country, you recognize them. They deserve to be recognized. The US had an attitude that really said that recognition, US recognition, was a sort of reward that was bestowed upon the new regime in uh, recognition of their good behavior, really. So the US didn't want to allow the communists to take over. The US had supported Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, they'd been uh, backing the nationalists surreptitiously in the civil war, and they were not ready to let go of that attitude yet. The British cabinet decided in mid-December that they would recognize the Central People's Government. 15th of December, 1949, they gave Be Bevin the go-ahead to recognize the communists on a date that he was to uh, decide after consulting uh, allies. So the decision was not immediately announced. It was to be effective when the Foreign Office thought fit. And during this period, late December of 1949, there were literally daily visits by US Embassy staff and State Department officials to the Foreign Office in London, lobbying for Britain not to recognize the communists, and to act, take executive action to secure the planes for the US claimants. The pressure was such that an urgent meeting was convened by high officials of the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office on the 31st of December, 1949, which was a Saturday and was a holiday. So it was highly unusual to find uh, to, to find the officials working at that time, but they were so, so urgent they felt they had to hammer out a policy about these aircraft and the attitude uh, to the communist regime uh, to brief ministers, British ministers, 
about what to do and how to react particularly to the US pressure. The Prime Minister Clement Attlee was briefed about it uh, and the Foreign Office Ministers uh, reached agreement with him about what to say to the USA and what to say to the world. Donovan was active during this period. He was pressuring the State Department. He went to London from Washington and visited the Foreign Office in, in mid-December and informed the Foreign Office of the sale of the planes. He had documents with him uh, and said to the Foreign Office, tell Grantham I've shown you the evidence that these, these aircraft have been sold to American interests. And he asked, of course, for executive action. In Hong Kong, Rankin <coughs> and Shenault and Willow visited the governor to pressurize Grantham on the 20th of December and showed him the proof of the sale. He said, well, I'm sorry, but this is a matter for the courts. I can't possibly do anything about it. And the Foreign Office's res response to the pressure was likewise. Title to the planes is a legal question which will be decided by the courts. British, British officials, Hong Kong officials, would not interfere in the court process. And that was a consistent line that Britain held to throughout the saga, a sort of mantra that they repeated. Britain was extremely concerned to keep neutral in this. Why? Well, they hoped to res resurrect British, uh, Brit British business interests in mainland China. It, it seems now a bit, uh, uh, fantastic that they thought that the uh, firms, the British firms, which had dominated in, the, in certain sectors in China under the nationalist regime, would be allowed to resume after the end of the Civil War, would be allowed to resume their operations. But there was still hope, they thought, and we don't want to offend the communists. But they were also concerned to protect Hong Kong. Um, it was unknown what the PRC intentions were, and there were all these refu so-called refugees uh, crowding into Hong Kong, uh, up, up to a million, uh, half a million of them in the last three months, it was reckoned, of 1949. There's a terrible housing shortage and all these squatters, and at the same time, fear of consequential disorder within the colony. Britain also wanted to protect its its interests in Southeast Asia. There was, colonial, there was communist influence in the colonies, Singapore and Malaya, and also the French in Vietnam, what is now Vietnam, uh, were resisting communist infiltration. So there was a fear that uh, this would get worse if uh, there was no control on the communists in Hong Kong. And of course, not least, Britain wanted to placate the USA because the USA was giving economic and military aid to Britain. Britain was effectively bankrupt as a result of the Second World War, and they very much needed that help from across the Atlantic. Donovan, having drawn a blank in London, flew to Hong Kong at the end of 1949 to push for executive action from the authorities here. And he, together with Rankin, met Governor Grantham on the 4th of January, 1950. And in effect, the meeting turned into a confrontation. Donovan pressed the governor to use his executive powers. Grantham said, no, title is a matter of law. It's all sub judice. I can't get involved. Gra uh, Donovan became upset. He tried, he tried persuasion. He said, well, look, these, these planes are really American. They're Lend-Lease. That was wrong. They weren't, in fact, Lend-Lease. Uh, they, they're not leased to uh, China, they were actually being bought, though it's a big discount by the Chinese airlines, but he was willing to exaggerate in his attempt to persuade the governor. 
He said, look, they're, they're US registered. And indeed they were. The US authorities had cut corners to register the airplanes quickly with the aviation authorities in Washington. He said, oh, the security of Hong Kong is at stake. Uh, the security of Formosa is at stake. But the governor wouldn't, wouldn't be moved. So then he started being more threatening. He said, well, Britain wouldn't have won the war without the Americans. We're allies. Uh, why aren't you helping us? Uh, and then he said, well, the USA, uh, I'll make sure that the USA to Britain is terminated if you don't help. And I'll make things hot for you, Grantham, in London, if you don't cooperate. But he had, he had underestimated Grantham. Grantham was a long-term uh, British uh, colonial servant. He'd fought in the First World War, and he knew he was, in fact, qualified as, as a barrister uh, during his service in the, in the colonies. And uh, he just stuck to the line. No, it's all subjudice. I can't do anything. You can go and see my attorney general, he said, and see if you can get, make any headway with him. So later the same day, Donovan went to see Griffin, the Hong Kong attorney general, but he got a similar response. The attorney general refused to intervene. And there was what uh, the Foreign Office note said, an abrupt departure from the meeting uh, by General Donovan. The abrupt departure led Donovan to give a press conference immediately after in the evening. The press loved it, of course. And he said, oh, the British are uncooperative. Uh, they're not, they're, they're not, uh, si not taking sides. The Foreign Office was totally appalled by this conduct uh, and, and thought that Donovan had re re revealed confidential information. And there was a diplomatic complaint by the permanent head of the Foreign Office to the US charge d'affaires in London. Then there was another development, another twist. Midnight on the 5th, 6th of January, 1950, the UK formally recognized the communist central people's government as the legitimate government of China and withdrew recognition from the nationalists. However, there was no diplomatic, there were no diplomatic relations established. Britain thought, well, we'll recognize them, then we'll have diplomatic relations and we can start lobbying for restoration of British interests. But Joe and I said, oh, well, thank you very much. But diplomatic relations will have to be negotiated. This was not the usual response. And he said, well, uh, our, our demands are that you release our, in, uh, our planes from Kai Tak Air, Airport and you vote for the People's Republic of China admission to the United Nations and some other, uh, some other demands as well. Uh, withdraw diplomatic representation from Formosa, where Britain ha had a con consul. So this was another problem encountered for Britain. The US diplomatic pressure continued. They started, they started making unfounded allegations picked up from Donovan and Chenault, discrimination by the British against the CAT. They said that the UK and Hong Kong governments were permitting sabotage of the planes. They claimed that Grantham was placating the communists. There's probably some truth in that, in the sense that Grantham wanted to be rid of the planes, and he thought the easiest way was to let the communists have them. And these allegations were repeated in a long diplomatic note to the Foreign Office from the US Embassy in mid-February, leading to a strong response from the Foreign Office. So there, there were strained relations between the US and the UK, strained diplomatic relations. But by February, all eyes were shifting to the courts, uh, specifically to Sir Leslie Gibbs, who was the then Chief Justice of Hong Kong. And he was due to hear an app the application for the appointment of receivers on the 23rd of February, 1950. 
and that, that took a couple of days, the hearing. Both sides engaged prominent counsel uh, to argue the case, uh, and the outcome was that a surprise was that Gibson refused the application. He refused to appoint receivers, but moreover, he removed the injunctions restraining the, re the removal of the aeroplanes. What was a surprise was the main basis for his decision. He said, I can't decide this because of sovereign immunity. He said this litigation impugns the newly recognized government of the People's Republic of China. Why? Well, the, Repub the People's Republic was not a party to the litigation. The defendants were uh, workers and, and communist sympathizers who were thought to be holding the planes. Because incidentally, Wilkinson and Gris, and Gris were having a great, great difficulty identifying who was actually in control of the the aircraft, but they did manage to name, I think, about a dozen people who they thought were holding the planes. So, so the, the PRC was not a party to the litigation, but in the law of sovereign immunity, that doesn't matter if uh, indirectly a government is impugned, affected by the litigation. So Sir Leslie said, I'm not getting, I can't get involved in this. Uh, one side has sovereign immunity, state immunity, and the courts will not adjudicate. But for good measure, he rejected the application on dis discretionary grounds as well. A, a number of discretionary considerations. The appointment of a receiver is always a discretionary matter for the court. So he covered all the bases. That outcome, caused consternation. It was said in America and in the press throughout the world, really, uh, that the judges had, or the judge, had awarded the planes to the communists. This, of course, was an exaggeration. But it, the result did mean that the planes were still under the day-to-day -day control of the communists. Dean Acheson, who was the American Secretary of, of State, protested to London and to Hong Kong about the outcome of the case, as if you know, the administrators were somehow responsible for the Chief Justice of Hong Kong. He called a press conference, Acheson called a press conference and said that he had vigorously protested about the outcome uh, to the British authorities. This was, was political theater, of course, because Acheson was coming under pressure in Congress. He was thought to be soft on communism. Uh, and uh, he was in the Truman administration, uh, which was democratic, Democrat administration. And the Republicans in Congress, particularly a senator called Nolan, uh, Noland, uh, were saying, that the perfidious British were holding our aeroplanes. Here we are providing military aid to the British, and they are giving aeroplanes to the communists in China. So there was a lot of politics going on behind the scenes, uh, stirred up partly, of course, by Shenault and Corcoran and Donovan. And there was a great fear of public opinion in the Democrat administration. Rankin, the uh, American representative in Hong Kong, told the Hong Kong government not to recognize the registration of the aircraft as Chinese. That, the, China, uh, China had recognized the aircraft uh, as belonging to them, but officially not until January uh, which was about a month after the Americans had done so. So there were two official claimants to the aircraft. Um, Rankin argued that if Britain, Hong Kong, recognized the uh, aircraft as Chinese, that would amount to confiscation of US property. And Oliver Franks, the UK ambassador in Washington, warned the British government of, co of congressional anger 
slowly it dawned in, in London the, what, it, what the result was of Gibson's decision that sovereign immunity, this argument, was an absolute bar to the court deciding the question of ownership. The courts wouldn't touch the substantive question. Branson was instructed to accept no re registration from either side of the aircraft for the time being, and was told to use the Chicago Convention on Civil Aviation, which was a wartime end 1944 convention for governing post-war civil aviation. And amongst other things, it required that any aircraft should be registered with one of the states who are parties to the convention. And that was, that was imposed on Hong Kong through a measure called the Colonial Air Navigation Order, an ordering council. So they said to uh, Grantham, use the Colonial Air Navigation uh, Order because that requires the aircraft to be registered with one of the contracting states. And there are two which are claiming it. So we, they are not complying with the convention, with, with the uh, Chicago Convention. And meanwhile, we'll seek advice from the Attorney General here in London about the legal side of it. Now, the Attorney General was in London was a man called Hartley Shawcross, who was another colorful character. Hartley Shawcross lived to be about 100 years old and had three wives, the last of which he eloped with at the age of 90 something to the consternation of his family in, in the early 2000s. But in 1949, he was a suave barrister who was advising the Labour government of which he was a member about international and domestic legal questions. The Foreign Office continued to publicly maintain that the question of ownership was one for the courts and they wouldn't interfere. And they actually prepare, prepared a circular defending British policy, which they sent round to British uh, diplomats around the world so that they could deal with, the pre with press inquiries about it. Um, but privately, Bevan and the Foreign Office was reassuring the State Department that all legal steps would be taken to retain the planes in Hong Kong and not let the communists get them. So Britain was pay, playing a double game. There was even tension, though, between the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office in London. Grantham, his boss was the Colonial Secretary, he stressed the importance of British neutrality on these political issues. And the Colonial Office uh, was uh, appalled that the Foreign Office was secretly placating the Americans. And they said, well, hold on, this is contrary to our agreed policy of neutrality. And there are alarming possibilities for trouble in Hong Kong if you, if you pursue that line. Grantham was saying, There'll be terrible harm to British prestige and the rule of law if the courts are not allowed to adjudicate the dispute. Duncan was also skeptical that he had power under, under that Chicago Convention and, and the Colonial Air Navigation Order to retain the planes. Uh, he said, well, hold on, this is all about air safety. It's not about uh, registration. <laughs> and in fact, Shawcross agreed with that. Meantime, equipment and spare parts, millions of, uh, of dollars worth of equipment and spare parts, which was in Hong Kong, was being shipped out on Hong Kong registered boats to China. This was mid-March. And the const that, that caused concern to British military chiefs because they wanted to stop the shipments. Grantham wanted the planes removed, as I mentioned. He blamed the Kuomintang uh, and the Americans for not flying out the planes back in June 1949 when he asked them to do it. And the junior minister at the Foreign Office, Kenneth Younger, agreed with him on that. So there were these disagreements happening within the British government. The Foreign Office, meanwhile, was saying, why doesn't CAT appeal the Chief Justice's decision? Why, why don't they get on with it? And finally, notice of appeal was lodged on the 8th of March to the appeal court, which in those days was the full court in Hong Kong. In April 1950, time bombs were set up by nationalist agents. 
uh, seven of the planes were damaged. Zhou Enlai blamed the Hong Kong government for that. Meantime, on the 3rd of April, Sir Hartley Shawcross Cross delivered his legal opinion, his first written opinion on the matter. And he concluded very unhelpfully that there was no legal precedent for this. He couldn't give legal guidance to the British government. It was political rather than a legal que uh, question. But he did suggest using co the colonial air navigation or order to hold the planes for the time being, though he had no real confidence in that. And Grantham said, well, hold on, um, I, I, I'm going to be legally challenged, ju judicial review in modern terms about this if, if, we, if, if we take that line, uh, and that'll be a big blow to me and our prestige. I don't want to do it. But it the navigation order is to do with flight safety, not to do uh, with uh, stopping planes from flying. And Grantham actually mentioned other power, uh, powers, including the Emergency Regulations Ordinance, which had been recently enacted, which you may remember was used by the government in 2019 to, uh, to act against the uh, riots and civil disorder that was taking place at that time. He also mentioned export controls, neither of which Hartley Shawcross was aware of at the time of his first opinion. So Grantham was opposing the use of these measures at the same time as pointing them out. There was a cabinet meeting in London on the 6th of April. Shawcross went along. He normally didn't attend cabinet. And there was a new twist. He went to the cabinet and he said, I've changed my mind. He said, don't use the air navigation order. I think what we have to do is to have an order in council overriding the uh, the, the uh, state immunity, sovereign immunity. I'll write a second opinion, he said. So meantime, the cabinet said, all right, we'll defer decision pending this other opinion. We'll see what Shawcross has to say. He delivered his second opinion on the 17th of April. He reiterated it was all really a question of political judgment, but he suggested an order in council to in effect say sovereign immunity will not apply in this case. And the cabinet approved that on the 24th of April. <clears throat> and on the 10th of May, the Supreme Court of Hong Kong brackets jurisdiction order 1950 was made. Now the purpose of this was really to make sure that the Hong Kong courts did their job and adjudicated on ownership. Uh, but the purpose was apparent also to the, at least to the central people's government that this was really a, a means of stopping them getting the planes. And they protested about the measure, about, about the order. They said it's a most unfriendly attitude of the United Kingdom, that was 21st of May, uh, and it would affect negotiations for diplomatic relations. Now, what's an order in council? It's an order of the King's Privy Council. King in those days, Queen later, and then King again now, of course. Um, the Privy Council, under the royal prerogative, it's a method of legislating, really, by the executive for the colonies, amongst other things, for the colonies. Uh, and the, indeed, the air navigation order, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, is an example of such uh, an order in council. So it was really government legislation. It's quick and efficient, and it bypasses parliament and therefore avoids political trouble. The ordering council uh, provided for the abolition of sovereign or state immunity in litigation in Hong Kong concerning the assets of the two airlines. So it was very much circumscribed <laughs> and uh, most unusual, naturally. Uh, and it made provision, amongst other things, for an inquiry by the Hong Kong courts into the question of, of ownership of the airline's assets. Not a, not a, a traditional trial, but more, more uh, uh, an inquiry into it. Uh, younger, the deputy foreign minister in, in London, may, uh, had kept a diary, and he said, 
the planes will not be allowed to leave until a court decision on ownership is decided is made. Now, three days later, after the order in council, the full court, the appeal court in Hong Kong, delivered judgment on the appeal from the Chief Justice. Uh, by that time, of course, their decision had become academic, but they, they affirmed the decision uh, of the Chief Justice and took a very deferential attitude in their judgments towards the central people's government. CAT almost immediately started fresh proceedings under the ordering council procedure. There was then another twist because the communist workers and their sympathizers did not contest CAT's claim. They weren't going to play ball with the new game set up by the British government. But the ordering council anticip anticipated that because they said to the court, you inquire, you adjudicate between the competing arguments, even if nobody turns up to make them. There was another development in late June of 1950, the Korean War broke out. And President Truman ordered US forces to support South Korea and also to protect Formosa, as Taiwan was then known. And Ernest Bevin said, why did he do that? What's Formosa got to do with Korea? The UN passed resolutions in the absence of the Russians calling on North Korea to withdraw and for members to support South Korea. Uh, the PRC supported North Korea re initially rhetorically. And of course, the UK had to support the US position. And in October, 1950, the plot thickened when Chinese volunteers, so-called volunteers in Korea, entered the fighting in support of the North Koreans and stopped the UN forces advance and started to reverse the, uh, or the, the front line. The UN passed a resolution China had engaged in aggression as a result of that, and there was then a UN, UN embargo on the export of strategic materials to China. That was in May 1951. So it really altered the atmosphere. It was unthinkable after that that Britain could return the planes to the Chinese communists. However, officially, the UK was still maintaining that ownership of the planes was a matter for the courts. The, internally, the Foreign Office officials were minuting that it's undesirable for the aircraft to get into Chinese hands after the uh, intervention in Korea. Grantham said, well, that's all very well. well what shall I do if the uh, planes are awarded to China under the, under the new litigation? <clears throat> And the, the colonial office said, said, well, do what you can to, to, to hold on to it. The, uh, the, the, the inquiry uh, began before a new chief justice, Justice Howe, in uh, March 1951. Howe considered all the points argued in the earlier litigation, except, of course, sovereign immunity. And in a judgment on the 21st of May 1951, he again found in favor of the communists and dismissed CAT's claim. There was a campaign in the US to save the planes from the communists. This was orchestrated by Shenold, by Corcoran, and amongst the people who got involved in all this were, were two future presidents of the US who were then congressmen, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was claiming that the democratic administration was soft on communism and their attitude towards the plains in Hong Kong was cited as an example of that softness. Consideration was given in London as to action to detain or dispose of the planes in uh, the middle of 1951. Uh, and uh, they were debating, well, can, can we destroy them? Grantham was saying, why don't we just push them into the harbor? He, didn't, he was sick of them. Uh, an appeal was lodged against the new Chief Justice's decision in July 1951. It was expedited, heard in August, uh, but there was no judgment 
until the end of the year, December, end of December 1951. CAT lost again before the appeal court, the full court. Uh, the Hong Kong judges thought that the sale was bogus uh, and they, let, uh, they managed to find a way of finding against CAT by latching onto a, a, a uh, obiter dictum of a, a new Lord Justice in the Court of Appeal, Denning, in London, in a, in a case concerning the, uh, the Polish government in exile, Boguslawski, it's called, which was then going through the, the uh, English courts in London. Uh, and he, Denning, explained state immunity. Uh, uh, sorry, state succession to property, that the new government succeeds to the property of the old one, uh, so that the communists were obliged, in theory, were obliged to follow, accept the obligations of the outgoing nationalist regime, including the contract of sale. However, Denning said there are exceptions to this, and one of them that he cited was if a new government uh, engages in what he called a breach of trusteeship. If it, if it sells, sells assets, for instance, for personal gain. But the planes were within the sphere of control of the de facto communist regime anyway, according to the Hong Kong judges. They said, well, they, they've actually got control of them. They had control of them in Hong Kong. They're in possession through their agents in Hong Kong, who are these, uh, these workers and sympathizers. So it's rather like ships, ships masters uh, can, uh, can turn to a new government. And it's the same with aeroplanes on neutral territory in Hong Kong. That was stretching the law a lot, but that was how desperate the Hong Kong courts were to find in favor of the new government, the new masters in Peking. <clears throat> there was a further appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. That was heard in late July 1952. It was expedited, I think partly through the influence of CAT's new leading council, who was none other than Sir Hartley Shawcross, the re retired attorney general in the outgoing Labour administration. So no expense was spared by CAT and the Americans to persuade the Privy Council that they were the, in the right. And Viscount Simon was selected to chair the board of the Privy Council. He was an astute selection because he was a retired politician. He had held many leading offices in UK governments in the 1930s and 40s, and he was counted upon uh, as a safe pair, as a safe pair of hands. And uh, the Privy Council heard the case in July and announced the result uh, pretty promptly. I'm not going to tell you the outcome uh, because I don't want to spoil your enjoyment of the book if you decide you want to, want to read it. There are in fact more twists and turns in the saga, uh, which I haven't mentioned, uh, which uh, are revealing of the political realities that were going on in the background to it. It's a very long tale I have just summarized it for you this afternoon, uh, and I hope that it has whetted your appetite for further investigation. Uh, that's all I'm going to say for now. I hope that you have questions. I'll be pleased to answer them. I'll hand back to Steve to uh, deal with any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Oh, sorry, but thank you very much, Malcolm. And uh, yeah, a great story and leaving us on tender hooks to what happens at the end, of course, there. Uh, a great way to promote the book. And very shortly, I'll give you, uh, we'll share with you that promotional code for the discounts. So please, if you've got any questions, please feel free to chat them into me uh, about the story so far. 
Um, I have got some questions and I, I know that there are other questions that have come in, but uh, just on uh, a couple of matters. So um, it's obviously that uh, the attorney, the former attorney general Shawcross, that he did quite well out of the matter in many ways, did he? Uh, is this a, a sign of lawyers perhaps enjoying this sort of argument? Ongoing? It certainly, it certainly is. It, of course, things were different in those days. Conflicts of interest abounded. You, 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 you judges were, were politicians became judges mm. very quickly in the UK. And the attorney general was was a political appointment. So was the the Chief Justice, and Shawcross had his eyes on becoming Chief Justice, in fact, but there were other politicians who were senior to him who did as well. He, he, he also fancied himself as becoming Foreign Secretary uh, after Bevin died, but he was disappointed in that uh, as well. So he, he was a mover and shaker. He, he had been a real high, high flyer in his earlier career. He was actually appointed as a so-called commissioner during the Second World War, uh, he came from the northwest of England, from Lancashire, and he was going to, in the event of a German invasion of Britain, he was going to be in charge of civil administration in Lancashire right. and at the age of 30 something. You know, so he, he had a, a career of over 60 years, I think it was, uh, amongst the great and the good in, in Britain. So yes, a high flyer, although I'm not sure how the government would have been impressed with his second opinion, because I thought they, they probably thought that was going to end matters and he would come up with a solution in a way. Well, he, just... did, he did come up with a solution. It was a blunt instrument, of course. And his opinion contains nothing about sovereign immunity. He, he, he could discuss the political questions, as I mentioned. He said, well, this, this ordering council might very well uh, scupper our attempts to re-establish British influence in China, but it's probably too late anyway now. It's six months or more of this new government, and they've shown no interest in diplomatic relations or commercial relations, so it's probably a lost cause. But he didn't say to the cabinet, uh, by the way, sovereign immunity, uh, if, you, if you take it away, it's a great insult to any government. To this new government in China. You know, it, 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 sovereign immunity is based on comity, reciprocity between governments. And by taking it away, you're really saying, you, the new government in Peking, you don't deserve to, to be shielded from litigation in our courts or in the courts of Hong Kong, our colony. Uh, it's, an, it's in effect an insult. Uh, and if I'd been a member of the British government, I would have liked to know that. There was no voiced opposition in the British cabinet at the time, but there were about half a dozen more radical junior ministers, including the Foreign Office Minister Younger, who I mentioned, who were very upset by the Labour government's attitude towards the Americans in this saga of the aeroplane. So it wasn't completely one, one sided, but mm. it, he does seem to have pulled the wool over the eyes of the cabinet in his second opinion, which is largely devoted to political considerations, you know, on the one hand, this on the other hand. Do you think that and then afterwards the courts, when they start to get into uh, a state succession, and considering Denning's uh, comments upon this, is that more of an idea that they're saying, well, actually, we do have to respect? The fact of the, well, they had to accept the law of state succession, but they latched on to this exception, which had been voiced by Denning in the Boguslawski, the Polish case. But what Denning had in mind was where you get you get a dictator who who take, jumps on an airplane, as Chiang Kai Shek did, with all all the loot, all the money and the treasures, you know, and sets himself up elsewhere with the people's money. They weren't really concerned with an asset which was, was ongoing and which could be used for the benefit of, of people. So there's a very high-minded judgment by how the Chief Justice and agreed with by the full court about uh, the attitude to take towards the new Peking government. They're very deferential towards them. And uh, put yourself in their position that, that they were sitting in Hong Kong uh, and they didn't know what this new communist government was going to attitude was going to take towards Hong Kong, uh, and no doubt there were conversations going on behind the scenes, 
uh, Hong Kong club and so on about the litigation and the potential effect politically. So they they wanted to make they wanted to distance Hong Kong from the decision, and that incidentally was uh, Shaw Cross's main argument for an order in council was this will take it out of the hands really of Hong Kong and put it under responsibility under the British government. The British government will, will set, put the order in council in place, and that will be seen to be a, a, a London initiative, not a Hong Kong. Uh, well, that, that's true, but of course it didn't stop the poor old Hong Kong judges having to decide the case. Yes, I think, I mean, you can see earlier as well when you said that Leslie Gibson, uh, in his judgment as well, he was, when he said about state immunity, it was almost as if this is too hot a coal for anyone to hold. None of us want to hold on to this. Yes. Was there much in Hong Kong? Have you found any information about how it was being considered by, by people in the Hong Kong club or <laughs> others? Because... Of course, they'd have also been thinking not just of the political side, but also of the trade side, of the economic yeah, side. Yes. Really. Yeah. Well, uh, not not really. I mean, there, there was a pressure group of, of, of British businessmen with interests in China and Hong Kong, of course, who who were lobbying the Labour governments, but they were really taking commercial at, attitude towards it. Um, but but there certainly there, there must have been concern in, in Hong Kong about what was going to happen. As, as you can imagine, there are all sorts of rumours flying around, yes, about what, what might occur. And then what happened with Grantham in the end? Can we, uh, what, do you know much about his career afterwards? Did he have a career afterwards? Well, well, well it was his last post. He, he, he'd been a governor in Fiji and he'd been a colonial secretary in several other places, Africa and the Caribbean. And so he was re reaching the end of his, he was in his late 50s. He'd been appointed in, I think, 1914 seven and he served for 10 years so he still had uh, quite a few years to go he certainly came, didn't suffer as a result i think he was regarded as Hong, one of hong kong's better governments uh, and he in his memoirs he he sort of skated around this uh, but he, he he plainly disliked the attitude of the british government and, and wished that they had just you know, got rid of these planes early on and saved him the, the bother. But he was very diplomatic the way he put it in his in his memoirs. I think you have to be in that mm. position, don't you, whatever else. Well, well, he he was retired, so he could yeah. have been more open. These days, it would have been in the newspapers, his memoirs, within a, a, a year of his retirement, of course. But now, in those days, no. I think that's other former governments. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just trying to think with Grantham and his memory in Hong Kong. I can't think of many places named after him. I think there is the fireboat, isn't there? On that, the that's that's his wife. It's named oh, after uh, Lady Maureen. Oh, that's that's right. right. His, his little American wife. Um, I think there's a, a college of further education or a right. um, teacher training college. Was but, but he didn't warrant a road or anything else. Not that I know. Yes, maybe we'll find out <laughs> later on. But then that other idea that you said that he mentioned the idea of actually pushing them into the harbour, just getting rid of them. And you said that the nationalists, it was suspected that nationalists had, had set the bombs off at one point or whatever else. Yes. Is there any further information that that was considered? Perhaps, you know, just just remove them in some way, the whole problem? Um, not really. I mean, there were different views flying around. Uh, Ministry of Defence, uh, uh, as well as Foreign Office and Colonial Office. Uh, but I think the, they were all sort of coming back to the same point, which is, well, let's the, let the court decide. We'll see how this pans out. We're, we're, not, we're not going to get involved in, in taking any action yet. Okay, thank you. Um, a question's come in. Uh, thank you for your great talk. What were the sources for your research and where did you find them? <laughs> oh, many sources. Uh, I, of course, one starts with the Privy, Privy Council's judgment and the ju various judgments there were three different sets of litigation in Hong Kong, and the, uh, the, the judges recite the evidence, which was affidavit evidence, written evidence, there, and they gave uh, quite, a, quite a few leads. Uh, being a lawyer, of course, I started there, and I was greatly assisted by uh, my friend and former colleague, uh, Peter Wesley Smith, who did re some research at the uh, records office, uh, public record office in London, 
and Kew Gardens, and he had actually been looking into attitudes towards the future of Hong Kong in the 1940s, and he noticed this on the side. He came to Hong Kong and mentioned it, and I said, I'm interested too, so we organized a tour that led to other leads. Uh, you just It's taken me years to follow all the various leads. I was also assisted by the reviewers who looked at the book for Hong Kong University Press and said, oh, there's some new uh, research in this area, Cold War, relations between Britain and China and so on by uh, Chinese scholars studying for PhDs in America and in Britain. I managed to get hold of some of their books, so some of their books, yes, and papers, and they were helpful in giving some hints of the Chinese attitude towards it, because of course I'm handicapped to not being able to read or speak Chinese, but I was able to dig out one or two leads about the Chinese side of it as well. Uh, and there's quite a bit online, including about uh, what became of the pilots Remember, there were a dozen planes flown back to China, 11, 11 stayed there, and the pilots who were bold enough to go, a lot of others were um, volunteering to go, but it, they got cold feet and finally didn't. But those who followed through with it, uh, they became prominent in the post-war civil aviation of the People's Republic of China. And their, their background is covered to some extent online as well. Unfortunately, because of their Western associations, they suffered very badly in the Cultural Revolution. So there are multiple sources. Uh, it was uh, very enjoyable digging it up, I, I must say. And I tried to weave together the, the newspapers as well at the time, for instance, uh, all. all um, um, Con consular documents as well, foreign office uh, and colonial office documents, newspaper documents, uh, lots of things going on all at the, all about the set at the same time. Thank you. And when the 11 planes were flown back, the 12 planes and the 11 that remained, um, how did they actually get them out of Taitang? Was there no... Sur sur yeah, surreptitiously. Yes. I mean, was it literally a fly going in? It, it was a fly-by-night operation, as far as I can tell. Yes, that's right. Uh, and so after that, of course, the authorities took measures to make sure it couldn't happen again. For instance, they they kept the, allowed only enough aviation fuel in the tanks to turn the engines over, so that they they could keep the the engines uh, going and test them, uh, but nobody could fly them for any distance out. And the, uh, the wings were taken off the planes. This is partly to preserve them when they were painted with, uh, with protective material. You've got that you can see the, 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 the one and only illustration is back to an artist's impression from photographs of one of the aeroplanes uh, uh, on the tarmac there. Yes, so, so there were some measures taken to stop a repeat of the embarrassment of, of the uh, 9th of November, 1949. It's quite embarrassing for it. They quite large planes as well, weren't they? So 11 large planes. Or so, 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 yeah, the ones that went were large planes. That's, that's right. Yeah, of course, they were. Most, the small ones were dismantled, so they could be carried. Now, there was great fear on the British side that although they could stop them flying, that the communists would dismantle them and ship them out by train or by boat to the mainland, avoiding the attempts to stop them leaving. Yes. Well, yeah, it seems a, a quite amazing feat to actually manage to, to smuggle 11 planes away or flying away in yes. the middle of the night. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there was some assistance in some way. Oh, there are lots of sympathizers at that point. Yeah. There. And bang, back to Grantham, you said that he retired immediately afterwards. No, no, he, oh, he was 1957. Oh, 57. But, uh, and he, he had quite a, a strong legacy. So is this, do you think, a positive thing for him that he had to deal with such an awkward thing in Hong Kong's history? Uh, well, I, I think that, the, that his handling of it was generally regarded as, as sound. He certainly didn't seem to be criticised in the colonial office. They sympathised with him. Um, but I think his legacy 
is more diverse than that. Uh, he, he's well known for quashing the democratic reforms, and of course, there are different views about that. Uh, but he certainly had a very clear eyed view about the best interests of Hong Kong at that time. And he's, he's stuck rigidly to, to the neutrality theme throughout his governorship. And it, and it worked in the sense that China kept its hands off Hong Kong throughout his, uh, his rule. Now, uh, another perhaps less well-known uh, legacy of his is the housing, uh, public housing initiatives. Murray McLehose uh, greatly extended them, but they were actually started by Grantham. Uh, he, he was not a socialist by any means, but he could see the dire housing situation in Hong Kong in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And he started in a modest way, the public housing program, which of course blossomed enormously thereafter. Thank you very much. Right, I think we've come to the end of our time uh, today. So I'd like to thank Malcolm once again for his sure. fourth seminar for the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series. Uh, a very interesting talk about a great subject. Uh, we have got a promotional code. I don't know if Connie can share that with you now. Yes, there is a promotional code. I think there is, for some of you, you can scan the QR code. I think if you can see the QR code. G-A-K-T. Oh, yeah. But there is a discount code on there as well. And you can get a 30% discount if you wish to purchase a copy of the book and find out the further details that Malcolm hasn't revealed to you today. And of course, in, in just under 90 minutes, it's very difficult to get the whole story across. And there's a lot more information to be read in the book. So thank you, Malcolm, for presenting today. Pleasure. And also, of course, I've got to uh, promote to you some of our upcoming events. So if Connie can share the last in our present series of Greater China Legal uh, History seminars will be on the 10th of March, the lunchtime slot again, Treaty for a Lost City, the historical background and legal implications of the joint declaration, which will be given by my colleague, Professor Chin Leng Lim. So uh, this again is a, a book that was published last year. Uh, um, um, Professor Chin published the Treaty for a Lost City last year, and he'll be discussing the book and the importance of the joint declaration, which of course, in recent years has been uh, a matter of discussion as well. So we'll be looking forward to that on the 10th of March. Then on the 17th of February, we've got the latest in our cross-border legal issues dialogues, which is the approach to domestic dismissing insolvency proceedings, uh, which will be held by Mr. Ernest Lung of the um, Wilberforce Chambers. And then the final thing to promote is on the 20th of February, again on a lunchtime slot, is the latest in our Greater Bay Area uh, forums, uh, competition law in the Greater Bay Area, uh, which uh, you'll be able to join again online via Zoom. And again, there is CPD accreditation available, I think, for all of these talks. So please free uh, check up on the website for the upcoming talks. You can sign up there for them and, of course, apply for CPD accreditation. So it only remains for me again to thank Professor Malcolm Merry for his great seminar again today. And to thank all of you for joining us. We've seen a lot of old friends when we looked through the list of participants earlier as we were scanning through. And uh, also to thank all of you that are joining us for the first time as well. And just hope that you come back to join us again in the future. We are CUHK Law. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.